Therapy Chat Podcast, Episode 68. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's Laura Reagan, LCSWC, with today's episode. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm really excited to bring you today's interview with someone I've admired for a while. Lisa Mitchell is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a registered art therapist in Sacramento, California. And she's also the author of an awesome book called Creativity as Co-Therapist about the creative process and how it parallels the therapeutic process and how we therapists can feel more into the flow of our work through opening up our creativity. This is just something that feels true to me. And I haven't read the whole book, but I really do think it's a wonderful, fabulous resource for therapists in opening up our creativity and connecting to kind of that flow state, which she explains all about in this interview and the book. So without any more delays, let's get started in my interview with Lisa Mitchell. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. Today, my guest is the wonderful art therapist, Lisa Mitchell. Lisa, thank you so much for being here on Therapy Chat today. Oh, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy too. Mm. I'm excited because I really love your work on creativity as as creative process as a parallel to the therapeutic process and how you weave that into your work in so many ways, including your latest book, Creativity as Co-Therapist, The Practitioner's Guide to the Art of Psychotherapy, which I, I have in front of me right now. So can you just tell our audience a little bit more about yourself and the work you do? I sure can. Let's see. And thanks for thanks for inviting me because it's always fun to it's always fun to enter into a creative process, which is actually the interview process, right? So what what shows up and what, what are we going to talk about? For me is just an acknowledgement that as we collaborate, Laura, in this conversation, that we're you and I are also being creative together. So thank you. Yeah, um, I love that you said that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it is. A podcast is a great creative outlet, even though it doesn't seem like it would be. Yeah. So... In terms of my work, I am. I'm a registered art therapist. I'm a licensed marriage family therapist. I'm also a licensed professional counselor. I work in California in um, Sacramento. And I have a private practice here where I specialize in working with actually teens and uh, professional women are my two sort of niche categories. People who really want to use art as a way of understanding themselves better and finding experiences that help them really resolve the issues that are going on in their lives. Then experiences in a sense of a creative expression type experience. And I've been doing that work here in private practice for the last over 20 years. So that's been just a really wonderful, good feeling kind of thing to connect in relationship with people and use the art process on a daily basis. Uh, it's been a it, it's been a really great part of my life. And like you mentioned, in terms of my book, uh, in the last. 10 years, uh, I've been really training therapists to integrate art into their work, both non-art therapists and art therapists, just ways to bring the art into a session uh, that is very, very based in the creative process, as opposed to based in sort of an instructional, manualized way. And it's been just a lovely journey to not only connect with so many therapists and hear how their work is so meaningful to them and how they want so badly to benefit their clients, uh, but also discover that therapy truly is an art form. And when we 
look at the creative process and we look at therapy, it fits beautifully. So I've been traveling all over the country and doing lots and lots of online workshops to teach therapists to embrace their practice um, as a creative art form, a way that is not at all step by step, but it is uh, f- you know, fully collaborative with their clients in an expressive experiential way. And uh, the result has been this new book uh, came out February of last year. Rutledge called and asked me to write it uh, from all of my blog posts and the wonderful interaction in the community that I have on Inner Canvas. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's about myself in terms of my view of the creative process and, and therapy in general. And also just, I guess, uh, what I hear coming out is just a thank you for being able to develop that in a community of people, therapists who are willing to collaborate with me and discover things about their work that you know, at face value, we don't necessarily see. But when we dive into it and look at it through that artist's lens, we see so much more. So that's me. Yeah, that's really, it's fascinating in my mind to think about what you're saying about art and creativity and the therapeutic process. One thing I often hear is that creating art is a very vulnerable experience. And I know in my training with working with expressive arts, and I'm not an art therapist, but helping trauma survivors process emotion through expressive arts. I learned that experientially and I noticed in my body something was happening and things would shift that really had very little to do with what actually came out onto the medium that I was using. Mm -hmm. It was more like the process of making it did something inside me. And I wouldn't have known that if I wasn't learning it that way in that, um, that training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think, that the research and the literature now really, from what we know about what's effective and how our brains work uh, in a sort of a, a biological way, an anatomical way, the experiential, any kind of experiential interaction in a therapeutic sense or in, a th- in the context of a therapeutic um, session or relationship is what we need to create as therapists and experience as clients in order to really unlock the the change agent or the transformation that is needed in order for the experiences to shift. And also for those exper- the lovely experiences to be solidified and, and absorbed in a in a really life affirming way. That if we just sit around talking about stuff uh, we're not addressing, like you said, Laura, our, the bodily experience, the sensory experience, the visual, the, you know, the tactile experience that really is where all of, uh, well, the majority, 90% of our interaction with the world comes from. So it is totally important for therapists as well as clients to embrace the experiential aspect of healing and when we do that, it is vulnerable. One of the main things that, that is vulnerable is that we take, we take our main coping mechanism or our sense-making you know, abilities with our cognitive brain offline and invite an expression that is probably not easily explained or understood. Then, you know, we, we have our, our art, our, you know, our poetry, our dance, our movement, our music as a way of uh, really sort of translating the experience. But we don't have the words that even can make sense out of it very easily, right? We can say, yeah, I drew a, you know, I drew a moon today, but really that embodied experience of the painting or the drawing or the music or the dance is what is causing the change. And I think in terms of your talking about the vulnerability, I think what's so lovely about that is there it invites the therapist to be in that not knowing vulnerable space with the client. And that shift alone solidifies a, a creative collaboration and a and a safety safe therapeutic relationship that 
really is a felt sense experience. It's a really an experienced um, based connection as opposed to something that's just verbalized or said or I don't know. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like, it's like the therapist is like, you can trust me. I won't judge you and all those (laughs) things. I accept you unconditionally and the client's like, oh, that's good. It's nice to hear and everything. And they see that you're not judging because of things you say and things like that. But when you do that, when you allow yourself to be vulnerable, it gives the client safety to be vulnerable too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And somehow that connection happens through that collaboration, like you said. Yeah. And I think, I think it's helpful to, you know, I teach a lot about the creative process and I think it's helpful in my book, you know, I name the five stages and to really walk through those five stages is to recognize that as a therapist and as a client, particularly in the, the third and fourth stage, which are really the actual process of diving into the art making or the creative expression material to really dive into that is to embrace not knowing how it's going to turn out. So the client doesn't know how the art or the creative expression is going to turn out. The therapist doesn't know either. And together in that vulnerable space of being curious and open and collaborative, therapist and client can really navigate the creative process. If it's too much, if it's too overwhelming and, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. Is it going to be okay? And, you know, um, really not being able to take care of the safety issues that not knowing can bring, then the whole creative process is blocked. It's, it's, it's locked up and the creative expression becomes really stilted. Like it's just an exercise of, um, you know, little meaning. And for the therapist, for sure, if the therapist doesn't trust or understand the fact that being uncertain and not knowing, or like you say, being vulnerable is part of the creative process, then it can be blocked as well. The therapist, oh no, you know, I I don't want to go there today with this client or, you know, I'm not sure that this is okay. And, and so without their ability to navigate that, that uncertainty or that unknown, they're not able to take the clients into an experience that can be so, so rich and experiential, valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa, have you noticed that therapists do not like being in that not knowing space? (laughs) Well, you (laughs) that's such a good question. I've noticed (laughs) that. (laughs) I mean, I think, I think it, yes, for sure. I teach so many therapists to navigate that. You know, I have a, my art fix course is really the course that Rutledge um, discovered when they wanted me to write a book. And I, much of my book is based on that, the course that goes a lot deeper. And when I invite therapists to do their own art and to look at it through the lens of the five stages of the creative process, most of therapists that I work with will say that they get blocked most at that place where they're supposed to know. They're supposed to know how it's going to turn out. They want to be reassured that it's going to either look good or be okay or be right. And that they have to spend a lot of time sort of like on the edge of the pool before they actually dive into that, you know, wonderful, luscious water of creative process because it's scary. Yeah. I think, though, that the pro- the sad thing is, is that that's, that's not something that we're all born with. It's something that is sort of educated out of us, mm-hmm. trained out of us. You know, if you watch a little kid who does art or a little kid who does dance, they do not stare at the paper and and worry and have anxiety attacks about what their art is going to look like. All they do is just dive in and love it, you know? And and the same with dance. They just let their body do it as opposed to worry about what it's going to look like. And so, I think when we practice that not knowing, and we understand that it's actually a sign of being creative, there's a muscle that gets strengthened and we really start to embrace it and then get so much freer in our work with clients, uh, so much more able to go to places that we can discover with our clients as opposed to that we have to lead our clients to or do to our clients or already know, you know, all about 
So yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a process for sure, but it's so worth it. <laughs> It is so worth it. And I love what you said about it being a muscle that you can strengthen because mm -hmm. I know I, I mean, I, I laughed how therapists don't like the not knowing, but I know that very deeply from myself that I didn't realize how uncomfortable I was with not knowing what was going to happen next mm -hmm. when I would, when I would try something. So I think a lot of times we want to get all the training, all the training, all the training, and then we never are really implementing it because we're not sure we know how to do it right. Mm -hmm. And so we don't do it at all. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then, or you can recite it back. You can give all the cognitive explanations for it, but you, mm -hmm. you don't use it and you don't feel it because mm -hmm. you don't allow yourself to have that felt sense, which I know what that is now, but um, can you explain what you meant when you said that it's like a felt sense? Because I think that's a kind of a hard concept to get, especially if you haven't heard of it before. Yeah, just in terms of the difference between an, a cognitive knowing and a full felt sense experience knowing. Let me give you an example. So, one of the really uh, regular art invitations that I use with clients is to teach them rainbow breathing. And, you know, as somebody who isn't using experiential uh you know, creative expression in their work with clients will walk their clients through a breathing exercise where they can do some mindfulness breathing, or they can teach them, you know, long inhale, long exhale, or even counting or seven count breaths, that kind of thing. And that's, that's, you know, helpful. It really is. I, know, I don't want to knock that as a way of, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. The thing that we can do is we can increase the experience so that it is a felt sense in all of our senses, okay, so that it's a fully embodied experience as opposed to a one, a, you know, a unisense. <laughs> That's a new term I just made up. That's funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> a unisense. <laughs> a unisense. Instead of multi-sense, a unisense. There you um, go. Yeah, that we can create these multi-sensory experiences that lead into felt sense experience. So, for mindful breathing, what I'll do is put a huge, long piece of paper on my painting wall, and I'll get the biggest brushes that I have, and I'll have the client uh, dip the big brush in uh, one big, you know, swatch of uh, color, paint color, and do a line that goes all the way up the page and all the way down the page and their body has to go all the way with the up and down as well as their breath has to follow as well as their eyes have to follow and their arm is following up and down, up and down. And I'll maybe even play some music to go along with it and increase the volume and decrease the volume as they are going. So then their mindful breathing is a felt sense experience that they can call upon whenever they need it. Just like rather than an instructional, oh yeah, I forgot to breathe. I need to do my breathing. It's let me step into that memory of actually feeling the breathing on multi, you know, on multi sensory levels. Mm. Yeah. So, so that's a, that's a little tiny example. And then when we get to transforming memories and trauma, um, that, the reminder doesn't have to come from the brain, which isn't going to work and from the cognitive part of your brain, which isn't going to work. Like, don't worry, you're fine. You know, th those kinds of reminders, mm -hmm. the felt sense experience can be called back up and felt and remembered as something real that happened and not instructed to be reminded of. Yeah. Yeah. That's Thank you. Thank you for explaining that. And it's very evocative. I can sort of see a picture when you describe it that way. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's so different from our cultural way of being in our heads <laughs> and not in our bodies. Yep. It's true. Yeah. The, and, and the, when we think about healing, when we think about recovery, it truly is a full experience, isn't it? It's a full body experience. It's not something that we just go read a book and then instruct ourselves to change. And so I think that it really behooves us as therapists to have those, those experiences with our clients in session. 
Yeah. So can you talk about the creative process a little bit more? And I know you described the stages in the book. Can you talk about how, what is the creative process and how it relates to the therapeutic process a little more in depth? For sure. It's one of my favorite topics. And, and, you know, I'm also recognizing that talking about it is just exactly what we were just talking about a second ago. It is not a felt sense experience. So we can only, we can only talk about the concepts and then um, hopefully the invitation is to go further with it in terms of experience. And for sure, my book has um, met like, I don't know, 15 or 20 different art invitations for people who want to really dive into the experience of the creative process. But let me just say that I get a lot of questions about the difference between an art therapist and a non-art therapist or an art therapist and an expressive arts therapist. And I think that while there are clear, there are ethical scope of um, experience and practice and, and um, degree territories and boundaries, and there's license, there's a title uh, legislation uh, that is definitely, you know, makes us certain people able to use the word art therapy and other people not. With that aside, I think that the major difference between a non-art therapist and an th- art therapist or expressive art therapist is the n- in, innate and intimate Um, knowledge of the creative process. So I think that anybody who wants to use art in session with clients really needs to become familiar, not only with how to use art in an effective way, but what the creative process actually entails, that that's the underpinnings of the whole, the whole deal. And if you don't know that you're really not using those um, ideas creatively. You're just using them as instruction. So the creative process, sorry, did I get too luxury on that? No, I think that was really important. <laughs> okay, good. And helpful. And I'm sure every art therapist listening is like, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And then I can, if I can also imagine that, you know, there's the concerns about um, the safety and the effect of, you know, safety issues, which are very real, but I'll piggyback on that as I talk about the creative process. Okay. Uh, so, you know, if we think about the creative process, I've broken it into five stages. Uh, it's a helpful construct to think about. There are very many different models of the creative process, but they do basically have the same elements. And uh, it goes like this. It goes, you have an initial idea. Well, let me back up. First, you have a time of daydreaming or incubation. You have a time that you're not quite sure what's going to happen or what uh, the uh, actual art activity is going to look like or what the actual session is even going to look like, how your client is going to show up, um, how the art is going to feel uh, that day. You have a a moment of sometimes it's a longer time of incubation. And I want to say that, you know, I think with the digital age and the speed of our society, We all have suffered from lack of incubation, Mm -hmm. whether we're a therapist or an artist or, you know, a creative soul. We fill that time that we would otherwise be daydreaming and just sort of having the soft focus with checking our phones, returning phone calls, um, looking up what the next step in our protocol is, you know, whatever it is, we fill that because we feel like we've been, I think, almost well, I would say brainwashed to think that if we're not doing something, it's not valuable. Mm -hmm. And so the creative process really asks us with that first stage to pause, to let our minds be fuzzy, let it be that we think about a whole bunch of things that might not feel related. But once we let our mind do that, we start to come up with new connections, new ideas, things that are, you know, combinations that we wouldn't have thought of had we uh, not paused and, you know, just sort of relaxed our brains for, for a while. So that's, so incubation starts the whole creative process. And then 
at some point, and it can happen um, for me, it happens a lot like when I'm taking a shower or if I am doing having a walk, we have ideas kind of pop into our brain. And it's really important in terms of being partnered with your creative process that you are trained, you're like ready for that idea. You can recognize it as something valuable to pay attention to. And um, uh, there've been lots of studies about the difference between highly creative people and not so creative people. And that's one of the things that highly creative people can do. They can, they can recognize a new idea quickly and hold on to it. So it's a, it's a practice. And uh, again, when you get good at it, it can even happen in session. Your client comes in, you're not quite sure what you're going to focus on today. Your client does a check-in and then the idea comes and it's like the, it's like, oh, such a great moment of insight. Right. And so then after the initial idea, this, the third stage is diving in. And we talked about that, that a second ago. That's one of those stages where it's really scary. It's really proposing to your client, you know, today I want to work on this with you. What do you think? Or I've been thinking about you and I've been thinking about, you know, this idea to use in therapy or to use as an art activity. Um, and I'd like to invite you to, to really, you know, explore that. Or it could be a confrontation, a challenge, or it could be even just the moment of putting your brush to a blank canvas. That starting point is the place of uh, real terror for a lot of people. And, and when you exercise that muscle and you really get excited about the possibilities and you get really curious about what's going to happen and you just dive in, then it becomes not a block anymore, but really sort of this moment of delight that you can dive in. And then the fourth stage is flexible commitment, where you really have to stay in the process, right? So that's the committed part where uh, you're in engaged in session, you're committed to being with your client for that moment, uh, for that hour, you're committed to doing your art, but you're infinitely flexible. One of the things that is so striking to me is that this flexible thinking, this flexibility, this ability to go one way, if you thought you were you know, going down one path and then you uh, had a change point or something that um, you know, took on new meaning or an accident happened where you p- spilled the paint and you see that as opportunity and you have to change direction, that flexibility correlates with resilience. And if a therapist is using it and a client is using it and they're both using it together in session, they're truly being creative and honoring the creative process, which then benefits both, right? In the long run as they go, you know, into the real life or outside of session. And then the last stage of the creative process is flow, which is just that delicious bliss, uh, when I ask therapists to capture uh, moments of flow with their clients, it's just a moment of it's just, it, the, it's a it's a celebration, right? The the moments when we feel so in sync with our clients and we feel like time has no longer an issue, um, we are really you know in that resonance place and. A client can make an aha insight or have an experience that they truly feel enriched by. That's a moment of flow. And uh, it's just the dessert for the whole creative process. It really is. But the thing that, Laura, back to the what's the creative process and, and ha- n- having therapists be able to be really intimate with their own creative process. The thing that is so fascinating to me is just like artists, therapists want all flow. They're like, oh, if it could only be like that all the time, it would be so, you know, wonderful. And artists want that too. They just want to go into their studio and plug in and lose time and feel so in it, right? And I think that we, we shortchange ourselves because the creative process is, that's only one small element of it. And if we really say, wow, all of the other stages are so vital to getting to that moment of flow that really 
we need to weigh them as much, if not more than flow as in, in, in importance. So being able to notice those moments of, you know, sheer terror of, is this the right thing? Or, you know, really those accidents where it feels like things were just a failure and you have to just give up, but their invitation to just take a different route. Those are really, really vital to the creative process. And when you can see it happening and celebrate it, it gives you this real artist's lens that um, informs your work and and really and encourages your client to be creative too. Yeah. And I think what I hear you saying is that you don't get to flow without <laughs> that other part of the process. Exactly. You, it's impossible. Right. It, it can is happen. kind of a metaphor for like life. <laughs> right. Totally. Right. We all want to be happy, but uh, you know, and be in that joy of life, but you, you can't get there without all of the other parts of it, right? Right. It's some of the tough times that actually not just make you appreciate the good times, but enrich mm-hmm. your experience of all the times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's a parallel to the therapeutic process too, because whatever you're trying to heal from, <laughs> there's the rooster. You, oh, can you hear them? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the rooster says, wake up. They're wild. They're not my pets. They're just wild out here at, outside my office. It's the craziest thing. <laughs> oh my gosh. I can imagine how that happens in session. You're like, oh, and the rooster just said, wake up. <laughs> right. Talk about flexible commitment. Yeah. You know, it's like, oops, the rooster just interrupted that one. Let's, <laughs> let's go. Now let's paint roosters. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I don't know. It's like everything is, everything is part of the process. And yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting to me. I mean, people talk about like the messy middle and being in the muck and, you know, no, mm-hmm. no lotus without mud or no mud, no lotus. And that's, but we're so uncomfortable. Like we don't want that hard part. We don't like that mm-hmm. discomfort. Yeah. We try to avoid it and go around it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, The wonderful thing for me about teaching people about the creative process, both therapists and clients, is that there there is flow to be had. And so, you know, sometimes we tell our clients, you know, oh, you know, you you have to go through hard stuff in order to, you know, grow. And we try to say that kind of comforting stuff. But when we walk them through a creative process and they get to sense that they get to, they get to really feel into their struggle and then the joy in one session, (laughs) we can use that and say, see, that's exactly what we're talking about. It's a, that's a micro experience of the broader experience of, of what you're going through and for therapists as well. Right. So if we think about, the difficulty and the quagmire that we wade through with clients and that all of that is valuable and necessary, even when it feels so difficult and maybe even that we're not being helpful, there are moments of flow that are so worth the rest of the whole difficulty, you know? So, yeah, but I think as we're resisting that part, we might get stuck right there and not get to flow if we're if we're too focused on oh no this isn't going how it was supposed to oh this is you know what I mean that's right that's exactly true yeah I think I went one year when I was doing my art fix course I did a just a little poll and 75 percent of the people that were participating that year said that when they encounter a fe- that same feeling that you just described Laura they immediately go to I should refer this client out. Mm. And it, sure, we need to think about whether we can be effective with clients. However, if we think about it as a creative process, there is so much more participation and flexibility in our approach than we just have to refer our client out. And and the benefit to the client is extraordinary if we begin to collaborate and we get, begin to invite them into a creative process with us. So yeah, we get stuck there and uh, then we don't benefit and neither do our clients. 
That's really fascinating. And thank you for saying that. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about, um, I saw on your website, you said, I'm an artist and a therapist. And I'm thinking about how when we are using creative expression in therapy or just when we're creatively expressing, (laughs) even Mm -hmm. if it's not in therapy, Mm -hmm. we tend to judge the end results so so harshly, you know, we tend to focus so much on beginning the process with what will the end result look like. Mm-hmm. And and I'm thinking about how, how do we separate like, you know, what art is as a construct is something that we look at, you know, mm-hmm. or a finished product like a poem or a dance performance. And it is the process of doing it, but culturally what like Da Vinci and Van Gogh and everything that we admire of art is that finished product. So how do we, how do we like separate that? Hmm. <laughs> I think that's too big of a question. For no, a podcast? it's an important question. And I, I could answer it in so many ways. And um, I think first of all, it's really important to separate the purpose. So if you're, Doing creative expression, either in the context of a therapy session or with yourself in, a, say, a visual journaling or, you know, whatever. And the purpose is to allow yourself to express in a nonverbal way. Then being really clear about that intention allows you to step aside from the inner critic in a different way. If your purpose is to make something beautiful, you want to hang over your couch then the intention becomes very, very different, right? Mm -hmm. And so really talking about that with clients and even with yourself about it doesn't, to me right now, what matters is that I get it out, that I express it and even understand it, even if it doesn't look pretty or good or whatever. It's it's a mirror of what is going on emotionally inside. Uh, Then, you know, you you can be clearer. The other part, so so that's helpful in the context of a therapy session um, or your own, you know, journaling session. If you are utilizing art for sort of a, a dual purpose, like it's something I enjoy and I like I like what turns out sometimes, um, and it's also a sort of a mirror into my inner life, and I like to see that and reflect that for myself and even share it with others. The thing that I talk about is. Uh, The fact that nobody seems to recognize the amount of discipline and time that skilled art really requires and the expectations that we place upon our own talent or our own product compares to like you're talking about Da Vinci, you know, or Van Gogh or those are people who make art have made art all day, every day in a practice form for years and years and years and years and years. And we don't get to see their mistakes or their, dif- you know, their, their, you know, stuff that they threw away or just cast aside. We only get to see the brilliance, the, the moments that are the, their most genius. And so giving yourself a really big fat break each time you make art until you get to like 20 years of discipline practice every day um, is is a way to really bypass that, that you don't get, quote, good unless you actually practice. So when I encounter that with clients, I tell them, you know, I even write signs to like, it's on sticky notes. I'm giving myself a big fat break today. And they laugh and think it's, you know, funny and cute and everything, but it helps. It helps bypass that. Yeah. Giving, literally giving yourself permission to be imperfect in that mm-hmm. moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. So I just love what you're doing and I'm more inspired by everything you just talked about your courses now. And I've seen some of what you have going on, but I just feel really interested in exploring more now. And I think a lot of people who are listening may be feeling the same way. So if you can kind of summarize some of the things that you offer and where people can find them. I think that would be great because I'm sure some people are like, who is this Lisa Mitchell and how can I get everything she does? 
Mm, thanks, Laura. Yeah, my um, my main web's website is innercanvas.com. And that website is a therapy for therapists mainly. I There are a lot of other mental health professionals and uh, service professionals that uh, like to visit that site as well. And there I offer online courses. Uh, I, I have two different ones that are going on right now. One is Art Fix, which uh, talks about the five stages of the creative process as it relates to therapy and um, really walks people through an experience where they can not only learn didactically about the five stages, but also make art to really look at and experience, have that felt sense experience of the creative process. Um, and I actually have enrollment is almost starting for my October course. So if people are interested, they can go to my page and find that. Um, the other course I just finished up today, it was lovely, so lovely. And it was um, going beyond words, the art of therapeutic relationship. And I've done a similar process where I've distilled the literature so that we can work on the four main elements of establishing a, an effective therapeutic relationship and created beautiful art invitations for therapists to explore those elements and really uh, take that into their relationships with their clients. So that's been a wonderful, wonderful experience as well, talking a lot to therapists about how they experience a therapeutic relationship with their clients and how they can strengthen that to be more effective in, let's see, I also have a creativity festival that is going to be coming up in May. And uh, actually, I don't know if people want to learn about the festival that we put on last year, Courtney Armstrong and I got 12 experts together and we talked more and more about the creative process and how it relates to therapy. Uh, it was a dynamic, incredible fe two-day festival. They can go ahead and visit innercanvas.com, get on my mailing list, and we'll be sending out information uh, soon about the second annual creativity festival, which was just fantastic. And that takes place in, in Sacramento? That is online. And, oh, okay. And it's kind of like a coffee shop uh, feel where people can watch the interviews and talk about the interviews, and then they are invited to do art uh, as a response and share. And it's just a, mm. it's an incredible uh, community rose up around that. Um, Sounds wonderful. Yeah. And then I also travel all around the country with um, cross-country education, doing trainings, for folks, to, therapists who want to integrate art into their practice. And those trainings are, I do 18 cities a year, and you can go to the Cross Country Education website and find me there. You can also sign up for my email newsletter, and you'll get cities and dates that I'll be traveling. So that's possible too. Wonderful. That sounds so great. So Lisa, thank you so much for being on Therapy Chat today. And oh, let's not forget your book, Creativity as Co-Therapist. Where can people find that? Amazon is the best place to do that. And uh, yeah, it's doing well over on Amazon. And if anybody has great feedback, um, reviews are absolutely welcomed over there. I'm starting to collect some reviews that uh, are just so, ah, I love it. So fun to read. So. Oh, awesome. Well, congratulations with that and everything you're doing. And thank you again so much for being on Therapy Chat today. It was really a pleasure to speak with you. Laura, thank you so much. Good to speak with you. I hope that if you're a therapist, you are inspired to get more creative in your life and in your therapy practice and your clinical work. And if you are someone who is wishing to experience more creativity in your therapy, maybe this has given you something to think about. As always, I'm grateful to all of you who listen. Thank you for your listening, your feedback, your ratings and reviews, your subscribing. All of those things help Therapy Chat be found on iTunes and the other places that it's hosted. And I'm grateful for each and every one of you. Stay tuned for some information about groups that I have going on starting in March 2017. Hey, this is Laura Reagan. I wanted to talk with you for a minute about connection, community, and groups. 
I've had several experiences recently which have shown me through my own direct experience that there's a different type of healing that happens in groups. One of the main points that we focus on in individual therapy is creating a safe space, repairing attachment through the therapeutic relationship. And people can talk about things in individual therapy sessions that they feel very ashamed about if they trust that their therapist won't judge them. And that's deeply powerful. And yet, doing the same thing in a group is very powerful in its own way. It's harder because you don't know the people in the group as well, or you don't have the necessarily the time to create the same type of connection that's solely focused on you like you do in individual therapy. In fact, it's more mutual like real relationships. The individual therapy experience recreates the attachment, repairing the attachment where the parent is focused on the child and it's one-sided. It's mutual love but it's focused on the child. In groups, people practice connecting with reciprocity, attending to one another's needs, and being attended to both. So that's different. And I have had a few group experiences over the past few years that have kind of shown me a lot about myself, the way I show up, how my trust issues play a role, and how scary it can be to feel supported by other people. As scary as it can be, it's deeply powerful. And it's something that is just different from individual therapy. You heard in my interview with Katie K. May, who we call the group's guru, in episode 67, how group work is just different from individual therapy work. I'm a certified Daring Way facilitator, which is the shame resiliency method based on the research of Brene Brown, and I'm offering a couple of Daring Way groups this spring of 2017. So if you want information about these groups, maybe you'd like to be a part of them if you're in the Baltimore, Maryland area, visit my website, and if you go to work with me, and then groups, you'll see a place to sign up and get on the email list of people who want information on groups. The Daring Way work is something that can bring up a lot of very deep issues, including trauma that you may not have been aware was there. And it's important to be at a certain stage in your own healing process before you start doing that kind of work in a group if you have trauma. And almost all of us have some kind of trauma. So there's a screening process to make sure that all the members of the group are a good fit and individual therapy is available for people who have not done that level of healing work yet and aren't ready to join the group yet, but may be interested in doing so in the future. So if you're interested in groups and you want to find out about the deep connections that can be created there, Visit my website, Laura Reagan LCSWC, and click on Work With Me, and there you'll find groups. And you can sign up for the email list to get all the information about the groups that I intend to begin in March. I'm planning on having a daytime and an evening Daring Way group, and possibly a Daring Way group for therapists if there's enough interest. Thanks so much. And if you're a therapist who might be considering my trauma therapist community, there's still time to register up until January 27th, 2017. So I hope you will consider joining us. And here's more information about that. If you are a trauma therapist looking for support and community, my trauma therapist community is still open for registration until January 27th, 2017. LauraReaganLCSWC.com slash join for all the details. Thank you for listening to the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, visit Laura's website at www.lauraregan.lcswc.com.